Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another live webcast with Capture. Today we will be continuing with the uh, tips and tricks session that we started with a few weeks ago. That means I've prepared a number of new topics to speak with you about, and I'm also going to try and cover a few of the questions that I left unanswered last time. But before we do that, I want to uh, recap some news that we've had the past weeks. Starting with our new resellers in uh, Slovenia and Croatia, Elsys. They carry familiar brands like Ari, ETC, Robert Juliet. We welcome them to the Capture reseller family. We've also finally got some badges on our website to prove our environmental commitment. Um, some of you maybe read the blog posts we've written about this. The first one was back in June last year, uh, following when uh, America had uh, announced that they were leaving the Paris Agreement. So this triggered a number of discussions within our company resulting in a few key decisions, such as trying to reduce the amount of travel we do, uh, donating to a few causes like uh, the ones we have chosen here. Um, they're the uh, World Wildlife Foundation and the Swedish Naturskyddsföreningen. They do practical as well as political work, both on a global and regional basis. You can read more about that on our blog if you're interested. And finally, uh, we had a user post a question recently on the Capture Design group on Facebook, asking for news about the next Capture release. So uh, I'm happy to officially announce that we started beta testing the next release yesterday. We don't have an official release date at this point. That all really depends on how the beta testing goes. But I do have uh, one bit of information to share with you about the new version. Not just because it's fun, but also because it's relevant for a number of users out there. And that is that the next release of Capture is going to be based not on OpenGL for visualization, but DirectX and Metal instead. So DirectX is the well-known graphics API on Windows, and Metal is Apple's new graphics API that they launched actually a few years ago, but it's starting to pick up now. And one of the top reasons we are moving away from OpenGL is that Apple have decided not to bring new OpenGL features into Mac OS anymore, which would leave us helplessly behind on a very old graphics API. So of course, this is going to lead to a number of improvements in the visualization, such as possibly performance improvements. If not now, then definitely in the long run. But most and foremost, we hope it's going to deliver better stability, because we've had a lot of issues with OpenGL drivers lately, especially with the high Sierra release on, on Mac which has given a few users a few headaches. So this is good news for Mac users struggling with High Sierra that we're shifting to Metal. I just a minor note, um, until we've done a lot of Metal testing on all Mac hardwares, there may be some issues out there. So um, if you're one of the Mac users that are having OpenGL issues now, uh, it would be helpful if you dropped us a mail at support at capturesweden.com. Maybe we could hook you up in the beta testing to get a few additional Mac hardwares that we can test the new render engine on. That could be quite helpful, actually. Anyway, more information about the new release will follow later on. So it's time to move on to the main theme of today, which is our tips and tricks session. So I've got my laptop here. I should also mention that we are in no way sponsored by MSI, who delivered this laptop, because we've bought it. Um, you're supposed to mention these things these days. So if we switch over to my computer here, I've got a project file that I've prepared 
to help me show you a few things that we're gonna go through now. If you have questions about the things I'm talking about, if you have questions about other things that you'd like me to talk about, then write them in the comment field below the video. My colleague is going to take care of relaying those questions to me here, so I can deal with them. The first thing I want to go through is related to smoke. So, Smoke in reality can be difficult to manage, especially if you're not in control of the air conditioning system in your venue. Fortunately in Capture we have more control over the smoke. So I wanna show you a few things that we can do with that. So we have a very simple design here, uh, consisting essentially of a stage in a room I've modeled the floor here of the room for a specific reason that you will see soon. Many of you might not bother to do that, but if you do, there are some key points here. So switching back to the live mode, you can see we have some smoke on stage already. And this smoke is coming from this smoke widget here, which if we zoom out a bit, is covering the entire room. And the reason it is covering the entire room and not just the stage is because it's, excuse me, it's adapting automatically to the size of your design. So that means there is smoke within this entire wireframe box here that symbolizes the smoke box as we call it. Now that means that if we take, I've placed some fixtures at the back of the stage here. Uh, there are just some uh, common uh, Niedervolt Parbol Spiegel Scheinwerfer that you would use quite normally. Um, if I light these guys, let me just prepare that, sorry. So if I light these guys, they're pretty strong. And as I focus them out in the audience, I get a very strong blinding effect. This, while it looks nice, is possibly not desirable. So let's talk about what options we have here. So as I mentioned, we have a smoke box covering the full room at the moment, and it's auto-sizing. That means I can't actually move it right now. It's fixed where it is. But we can change this by going to, to the selected items and disabling the auto size property. Once I've done that, the smoke widget here can be moved and you're in full control of the size properties, which means you can change the size of the smoke box. So for instance, let's reduce the depth a bit to 20 meters to begin with. It's still actually fully enclosing both the stage and the camera, but you can see that if I start moving the smoke box further towards the front of the stage, which is just up here, and I continue moving it, that it has a great effect on what these beams look like in the visualization. And I know many users may actually prefer this look rather than the other look. So it's important to keep in mind that this blinding effect that occurs in this case is actually caused in a sense by the smoke. If there is no smoke between the stage and the camera, there's nothing for the light to reflect on and blind you. Now I mentioned in the beginning here that I had drawn the floor for a particular reason. And that reason was that without the floor, if the smoke is auto-sizing, then you're effectively limiting the smoke around the stage area. And as soon as you add that floor piece again, 
since the smoke now surrounds the floor as well and your camera will be inside it, it looks completely different. So there are many takeaways here. Um, I would encourage you to, to play with the smoke settings. Apart from the auto size um, and the placement, of course, you also have control over the density. That is, if you want more or less smoke. And also the speed of the smoke, which can be changed from fast to very slow as well as the fact that you can combine multiple smoke boxes, so you could have a thinner haze in the auditorium and a thicker haze on stage. So let's see if we have any questions coming up here. We do, but nothing that I will answer right now. So the next thing I want to talk about is related to camera exposure. But first, I want to reduce the amount of smoke a bit. So let's take it down to 15%. And take out the light from that floor package again. So at the back of my design here, um, at the very back up here, we have a number of moving heads rigged. We have, I have. Um, and at the moment, they're giving off a red light. Now you can see as the camera rotates that if you're looking at the lights from the edge, they're not as bright as if you're looking at them more straight on. In fact, the closer we get and the more straight on we look, the whiter or brighter they appear. And the reason for this is connected to the camera exposure setting. You can find this setting in the views option down here in the design tab under the exposure setting. So at the moment we've got automatic exposure disabled and exposure adjustment set to zero. Now the default state is to have automatic exposure enabled. This means that Capture is trying to adjust the brightness of the view to whatever lighting situation you have at the moment. So if I turn these fixtures in the floor package on again, you pay close attention to the beams above the stage. It appears that they go dimmer as the floor package turns on. The reason for that is that Capture adjusts the brightness of the view or the exposure to match the incoming brightness of the beams. So if we have automatic exposure disabled, that is when we have a greater chance of being blinded by the beams. So both options are good ones depending on what kind of work you're doing at the moment. So they are both useful settings. And in addition to this, we also have the exposure adjustment. And this takes values from negative three to positive three. It's similar to your digital camera. So negative three dims the image and positive three makes it brighter. <coughs> Excuse me. So you remember I mentioned the moving heads at the back here initially. At the moment, they are set at an incredibly low intensity and they still appear reddish. But as the intensity go up, they're too bright for the virtual camera in capture and effectively they turn white. And when I say the virtual camera in capture, that is the camera that we have exposure control of here. So if I reduce the exposure or increase it, you can see how it's connected to what the individual LEDs look like in these moving heads. We've mentioned before that this is sometimes uh, quite annoying. If you're doing pixel mapping, you'd prefer to see it red rather than white. And this is something we're working on for the future to find better visualization modes. 
We have found, unfortunately, that it does have some adverse effects on other parts of the visualization when you do that, but there will be more about this in the near future. Anyhow, if you find yourself in a situation where all your fixture seems to be turning white rather than, in this case, red, then the underlying issue is connected to the brightness and the exposure setting. So now, looking at them slightly from the side, they still look red, while if I turn the exposure to max, there is almost whitish. So we have a question here um, regarding smoke adjustment from Pete Merilainen. Uh, whether this works in Capture Atlas or only in the latest version. So I believe smoke boxes were added in Capture Atlas, so they should work in Atlas and Nexum as well. Yes. <laughs> right. So at this point, I want to move on to something completely different, as they say in Monty Python. Uh, but before that, I'll cover uh, Martin Chesluk's question. He is asking about uh, OpenGL and uh, Mac OS. He's had mostly no problems on High Sierra, but he still loves leaving OpenGL. Well, we do too, actually. OpenGL has been around for quite long, and it hasn't really aged in a nice way. It is sometimes quite awkward for us to work with OpenGL, especially the newer features, which are kind of difficult to blend with the old stuff. So moving away from OpenGL will allow us to produce new features much faster. There's also a, another question from Martin again regarding ambient lighting that even with 100% ambient light, the plot stays pretty dark, especially for complete stage designs. Sometimes he just adds a bunch of Fresnels to get ambient lighting. It's difficult to answer that without seeing the specific stage design. However, if I bring this view back to something uh, <laughs> reasonable, you have to also keep in mind that the materials of the surfaces in a project have a lot of effect on how bright the visualization looks. So in this case, <coughs> the box I've used as a stage piece here, I haven't assigned any material, so it's got a default gray color. But if I create a new color for the stage box, or a new material actually, I apply that to the stage box, you will see that if, for instance, I apply a near black compared to if I apply a near white, there's a very big difference in brightness too. And I have seen quite a few times when you import objects from other design software, especially software that doesn't work with um, um, physical based rendering, that the colors that come in that might have looked good in the other software doesn't really fit a physical based rendering engine that well. So reviewing the colors may be a good option to the other lighting settings in the design as well. I kind of didn't really answer the question, but tried to deliver something else that was valuable. I hope that's okay. Right, another question is whether you can control the camera exposure with the DMX channel. And to be honest, I don't know off the top of my head. Uh, I would have to go to the manual, so I'll try and remember and get back and answer this question later. Right, so <coughs> let's move on to another topic that was brought up in the recent tips and tricks session related to patch export and Hog PC. So I promised I would show you that, and I'm going to tie that in with a few other questions as well. So in this design, I have a set of fixtures. They are mostly dimmer channels, but also a few moving heads. 
And what I'm gonna show you is how to export this patch information into HOG4 PC. In order to do this, there are two things we have to keep in mind that are important. Number one is you need to assign channel numbers in capture, otherwise they won't import into HOG. And these are the same channel numbers that you will referring to the fixtures by when programming in the HOG. One of the easiest ways to do this is using the sequential channel function. I've already sorted the fixtures by patch, which is, I suppose, a reasonable approach. And I'll use the sequential channel function, starting at number one and counting up. So now we have fixtures one, two, three, and so on, all the way up to number 12. Next, I go into the file menu. I choose export data. I need to give the file a name, so let's say patch. I hit save. At this point, we need to change the file type into the XML for HOG4 option and hit export. So now we come to the second step of the two things important, and this is the naming of the fixtures. So in order for the patch export to HOG to work, we need to name the fixtures exactly as they are in the fixture library in the HOG. So in this case, we've got some dimmer channels, so they might go as generic desk channels in the HOG. So obviously this bit here isn't very rewarding, but once we import, it is. And I know beforehand that uh, the Robies in this case, they are named exactly this way in the HOG. So I hit continue. Now I'm actually gonna take this all the way, so I am going to start HOG4 PC as well to show you um, both the import and a couple of other things related to the following questions about autofocus that I want to answer as well. <coughs> so once we are at the HOG or running HOG4 PC and we have our patch file available, what you would do is you would go to into the patch setup and use the import patch button at the top of the patch. Choose the file from capture and hit OK. At this point, the fixture names we gave in capture are mapped to the fixture names in the library in the hog and as you can see, we've got the full patch imported into the hog now. And if my network is with me, and if I remember this correctly, we also need to enable a little bit of output. Network, visualizer, settings. This could fail spectacularly, but I hope I'm lucky today. Ah, awesome. So, one through eight at full. There you go. So our floor package and the frenels are lit. So I mentioned I wanted to show you some other things in connection to this, and the thing I wanna show you is autofocus. So autofocus, <coughs> is a name, um, sorry, I'm trying to do things while talking, obviously that's not gonna work, so clear. Nine through 12 at full, and these are the um, moving heads at the back of the stage. So autofocus is a concept popularized many years ago, it's based on the idea that it's easier to focus fixtures in the virtual environment rather than using the encoder wheels of the lighting console. What that means in practice is that you can select and focus fixtures in the visualizer. This is when it's really good to have more than one computer screen, but that's not gonna work today. 
So if we bring up the programmer, you can see now that we have individual pan and tilt information coming in from capture um, on the fly as we're focusing in capture. This means that, or makes it very easy to record focus positions on the console, especially if you have many lights, you don't wanna go next, next, pan tilt, next, pan tilt for hours. This is a huge time saver. You may also notice that the fixture selection is coming through from capture into the hog. So that is the second feature supported between capture and the hog console. Now the way this works in capture is through what we call the console link. So that is the little mysterious bit down here that you may have, or you may have used it already, or you may have wondered about it. So console link is when capture is speaking more intelligently with a lighting console. And we have two types of console links available in capture. One is the direct connection I'm showing you here with the hog. And the other one is based on CITP. CITP is a network protocol that is open, which means any manufacturer could implement this type of communication with capture at any point, in fact, even without us knowing about it. And there are a few manufacturers that have implemented various bits of communication with capture. There's actually a number of different things that you can communicate about with capture over the network. So one of them is the autofocus, as I showed you. Also the fixture selection that I showed you that you can select fixtures both in capture and in the console. There's also a patch exchange. There is the ability to, to get a live view image from capture into the console. So if you're working on the AvoLite's Titan, for instance, and you're recording palettes, as you're recording beam or position palettes, you can have a, a picture from the live view in capture automatically applied as a legend for that palette in Titan. There's also a remote recording option that brings up a fourth button in capture. And now I can't find my mouse, there it is, <laughs> sorry. So down right in the corner of the design view, there's actually a fourth button that appears when you're connected to a console that supports remote recording. So the function of the button is actually decided on by the console, but the typical feature is record palette, record queue, and things like this. So you can remote, cons remote control the console from within capture to a certain extent. So the next question of course is which consoles support this? And the list is actually relatively long. We have, um, so this is when I have to read from the list. We have the Avolite's Titan, which is probably the one that supports most of the features. It has full show synchronization, so patch exchange, fixture positioning, the whole, the works. Uh, we have the Magic Q from Camsys, which also does autofocus, fixture selection, patch exchange. Uh, the Haythor from ADB, which does fixture selection and autofocus, I believe, not the patch bits as far as I know. Oh, they do the live image capture as well. So if you're recording cues or presets, I think they call them in the Haythor, then you can have the live image grab from capture into your queue list. And also the, the new Vibe console from Compulite supports um, I'm not sure about the patch bit, but definitely the autofocus and fixture selection bits. And finally, also the Strand Neo and the Light Factory software, they also support um, various bits of CITP communication. So the reason we're not listing all these compatible systems on our site is that it's kind of difficult for us to keep up with who has added what bits of functionality, but we would encourage you to push your favorite manufacturer to implement more of CITP because it makes capture a more valuable tool for you. 
Right, so <coughs> time to have a look at the questions. Um, Maurice van der Velde is asking about bringing in the full capture Nexon patch into CAMSYS. Um, yes, this should already be possible. We have, there was a showcase or actually rather there was a show recently that we shared a link to on Facebook, I believe, uh, in China, where they had done exactly this. They had transferred a, a, a complete patch either from or to capture, I can't remember, but magic Q capture CITP communication. So the trick there is to enable CITP communication with capture in, in the network settings per DMX universe inside the magic Q. Um, <coughs> we have a question from uh, Andre Marinovich. Hi Lars, in fixtures tab, second column called channel, that would be this one, what is it for? Apparently I found out it has some relation with capture patch, yep, can you clarify it? Right. So, we have a number of columns down here in the fixture tab, and they correspond to properties that you can also find under the selected items here. So we have the channel, we have the, the mode, the patch, and so on. I would say the most important ones are available in here. Let me just do that. Yes. <laughs> Sorry. Quit. So your question is about channel, and the channel number doesn't have any effect on how capture works in any way, but it is a number that is used in communication with consoles. So this is intended to be used as the number you would type on your console to light the fixture. So if you would go one at 50%, then one is what you would type into the channel column. So if you want to exchange patch information with the magic queue, for instance, as was asked recently, it is important to have the channel numbers assigned because otherwise the magic queue is unable to reason about the fixtures I have follow-up questions, right. So the channel number can be used freely, but is intended as the way you would enter fixture numbers in the console. The unit column can also be used freely um, and also allow, allows you to enter text if you wish. And that information is visible in the paperwork. Um, yeah, if you're using plot symbols, of course. So let's assign it to the moving head instead. So the unit information appears in the center of the fixture and the channel information appears in the annotation of the fixture. And finally, the circuit number again can be used for anything it's usually house circuit numbers, cross-patch circuit numbers. Some users even use it to encode multi-patch or multi-patch, um, multi-core power distribution information. So they might say multi-3, um, subgroup 1, things like this. All right, let's move on. Um, Yes, another question related to patch exchange and color filter information, uh, which was a feature that we had available in Capture, I think in Capture Polar, and even before that. That bit was uh, unfortunately left out of the new parts of the CITP protocol that were introduced with Capture Atlas. Uh, so it is one of the things we have on a list to introduce along with some other new features for an upcoming CITP revision. Uh, so we're at this point, we're gathering what else should be added so that we try and do more things at the time. One th another thing that we want to add at the same time is more intelligent rotation information as the capture 
XYZ rotation refers to the fixture when it's hung with the display towards the audience. Well, not in a, on a stage in the round, obviously, but so as a standard, the capture fixture is hung in a way that the display faces along the z-axis. Some other systems prefer to have the home position of the yoke along the z-axis. So there's essentially two dominating systems, and we need an option in CITP to support both, otherwise rotations end up mismatched. So that's an example of something else we want to add. Cause de Vries, please excuse my probably incorrect pronunciation, asks <clears throat> regarding the nudging of objects, whether we could bring in the ability to move objects around using the arrow keys on the keyboard. So this is a feature that has been asked for quite long, actually. Um, and I'm struggling to come up with good, ex good excuses why we haven't implemented it. But frankly, it is a relatively dangerous feature for the reason that arrow keys are very important for navigating several of the views in Capture in terms of moving user input focus. And if you have by accident focused a design view and you're doing things with the arrow keys, thinking that you're going to navigate, for instance, the design tab, then you will already have moved objects without realizing it in the design view. So that is, that is the main reason why we haven't added this feature, because it is, in fact, quite dangerous. Um, it's easy to make mistakes without realizing it, and without it necessarily be, being easy to undo it either, because then you would essentially need to hit undo as many times as you use the arrow key. Um, but it is still on the to-do list in terms of finding a decent workaround uh, of allowing it anyway. Another function, or sorry, another question is related to import DWG files for fixture drawings on plots. Uh, I would argue that we have this already. If you import a DWG file that has been drawn in a certain way, admittedly, so that each fixture is a block, then we have the features available in Capture to do a mass replace of blocks, which switches the dumb fixture symbols with proper capture fixtures. Another question is, it would be really nice to be able to use circuit number like in WIG with just clicking and auto plus one for circuit numbers. Um, all right, we'll take that under consideration. Uh, Cost de Fries is also asking, apart from the nudge option, that he would very much, quite really, really, like some PDF support and more short key functionality. We shall take that into advice, uh, the PDF part as well. Here, actually, it's worth mentioning that when it comes to importing PDFs, there are some good online solutions that are free that let you convert a PDF into a DWG so even though Capture doesn't natively import a PDF floor plan, there is at least a workaround available through the DWG format to get your floor plans into Capture. All right, I will squeeze in one, one last question before we call it a day here, <coughs> possibly two. Uh, Lauri Siren is asking, shift and arrow keys as a nudge command and make the undo stuff you did since pushing down shift previously. Yeah, so there are a number of options to how you could work around the issue with the arrow keys. Um, and we'll be happy to receive all suggestions in case there's one we haven't thought of. And finally from Ole in Norway, I presume, or Denmark, uh, is there any plans for favorites in the library so we can easily access often used fixtures? 
Yes, there is. Stay tuned. Um, great. All right. I've gone through the stuff I wanted to share with you today, and we've covered a number of questions as well. We hope to be back again with another live webcast in a few weeks. And in the meanwhile, I thank you for your attention, and um, thanks for watching.